Okay, I wanted to take a back step in the middle of uh, this video, which um, I have actually named, for my own personal reference, 8-2. Uh, this is week 8, uh, and probably a part 2 video. And I wanted to go back and add a few things because I wanted to show you some examples of UVing. I think I gave you guys a video where I did a little bit of UV work, but it was quite sped up. And um, just to add in some UV uh, knowledge, uh, how to make UV maps, um, I wanted to go back to the original mesh and maybe do an example. So, as you know, uh, I have my model sitting in Marmoset Viewer. Uh, this is the Marmoset Toolbag real-time render, of course. And I have an HDRI light or an image-based lighting system built in, uh, which uses an HDRI image. And I have loaded that image uh, or T-Sky into the scene so that I can start getting some lights on it. So over here on the scene pane, uh, this is pretty much all of the elements that you're going to find in the real-time render, uh, starting with Sky. Uh, and Sky is basically uh, all of those HDRIs that we have, and I've plugged them in so that I can uh, sample hot points from the map and start to you know get in you know certain points of lighting that that would be uh, good for the model so you know any type of lighting uh, that you know and I've done different lighting scenarios on this model thus far uh, we only have the head neck and chest mesh uh, worked out for final so far and pretty soon we're gonna be building out the arms uh, biceps and forearm pieces in and then the undersuit which would give at least the upper body uh, most of its parts but until I get most of that mapped out, uh, I have this to actually test out my lighting environment and kind of see exactly uh, what, you know, how the final is actually going to come close uh, with light. And there's a couple of different things here. There's the sky, and all of these points are collected points. So if I wanted to actually add in some lights or subtract some lights, I just move a point onto them. It's almost like a, a little pin and those give me more lights uh, in my scene. So skylight one through five are all of these these little points here, these little circles that you see. And individually, if I was to click on one of them, say here, I could adjust the brightness for one individual light and get more light. Uh, this also kind of adds to some lighting uh, that you get from just clicking on sky. And then there's the environment's overall brightness which I can adjust here, and the child light brightness, which child light seems to add a more flushed uh, light overall and bring out some details that may be a little bit more further behind. Uh, ignore that. Uh, so as I make small incremental adjustments, I can also come into my camera settings and say if I was to flip this over to the main camera and position it, I have two cameras set up and I can also shift the environment's lighting or rotate it by hitting shift and right mouse button and I can rotate, All right? So I can seek the more optimal uh, lighting scenario by turning the environment and its light. So this is pretty, pretty well lit. I really don't have to mess around with the level of light that it's getting. Maybe dim down some of them overall uh, because where it's striking the top of the helmet maybe getting a lot of like uh, light that's drowning out some of the details on the top. Uh, but there's also chromatic aberration, uh, which is under the camera settings for whichever camera that you're using. Uh, so if you go down this list, there are plenty of um, settings that you can use. Uh, transform has to do with its position and scale of where it is in the environment. Uh, that I really don't have to mess with too much unless I'm gonna move the, the physical camera. Uh, controls, uh, panning and move speed uh, have to do sometimes with the uh, rotation because you can do a capture uh, into an image sequence and actually do a turntable to rotate the model uh, when you're done. Uh, let's see, limits, as I think I explained in a, another part of coverage for this, uh, I believe, I can't remember if it was week seven or so, um, I might have actually explained a little bit of Marmoset already, but uh, uh, use limits in viewport with it checked on is basically a setting that you can use so that when you save a Marmoset viewer file, so in other words using WebGL 
and exporting this file so that you could showcase your models on uh, ArtStation or any uh, place where you you know you can put a model up. Um, even in some places like you know any type of art forms, uh, uh, you know your own portfolio uh, online, um, you can save out your model marmoset files to a marmoset viewer file. And what it does is it takes the environment plus the lights that you you have. Uh, put all of the maps together and makes a, a WebGL file that can be accessed by anyone and you can rotate the file. So using viewport or limits on viewport is basically setting some constraints on the rotation around the model. Uh, so that way, you know, like say if I have sort of a part in the back of the neck here and if I didn't want people to see on the inside of wherever there's a hole in my model, especially from like say the bottom, uh, or the bottom of the neck inside of the helmet. Uh, I could set constraints so that they could only view it, say, from this angle and, and turn it, and then maybe back down and then, you know, uh, straight ahead and look up maybe here. So that would be a different constraint on the Z forward uh, than the negative Z, that which would go in the back. So, you know, uh, things to pay attention to. In fact, actually for these settings specifically, I believe Marmoset actually has a tutorial where they talk about it in their updates feature uh, on Vimeo, uh, if you look them up or Google them. Uh, so do look into that. I'm not gonna set it right now because I, have, I don't have a complete model and I don't know where the holes are gonna sit thus far uh, until I finish it. So I'm gonna skip this part for a second. Uh, there are controls. Yeah, let's close that for the lens so if I open up the lens and the lens focus so field of view has to do with the actual uh, scope at which you know my camera is moving forward or backward uh, and sort of like the proportions of uh, you know like a film gate almost uh, how much of the camera lens is being opened up to look at the model so I have mine set fairly decently close and as I uh, change it uh, this millimeter size would be pretty consistent with a camera. So if I say 35 millimeter, uh, I'm getting a 35 millimeter view, or like say uh, even an 18 or 22, it's a little bit wider uh, of a field of view. Uh, I actually like for mine uh, 35, so I'm gonna leave it there. Uh, that's close enough so that I can get all of the details and still be on access to everything. So that is what that is. Uh, limits, of course, we already explained that. Lens uh, and focus. So under focus, this is one part that I wanted to talk about pretty pretty well, is the depth of field settings, uh, which is actually pretty awesome because with it checked on, uh, there are some objects that are gonna be closer and some further behind. Uh, it depends on how close you move up to your model, I suppose, but as I set it, when I go back, you'll notice that there's a slight blur. And that is actually due to the focus distance and aperture settings that I have under focus in my render. So if I pull forward just a little bit here, and my focus distance is already set, and I set my near blur right about there, and the far blur is a little bit higher, that means that when I rotate this model, certain edges will actually blend themselves with a little bit of a blur uh, so that you have uh, the perception of depth. Uh, you can set these and the maximum bokeh, or th that's a, the bokeh is like a Japanese word for, for blur or Gaussian blur. And so I guess they've adapted it here, but max bokeh size is uh, the actual amount of blur that you're overall applying and then you can set uh, how much blur you're getting from objects or corners or edges that are near and those that are farther from uh, your viewership in the camera. So check with these and try to uh, play with them if you get Marmoset. Remember, Marmoset's not bad uh, price-wise. In fact, um, if I should flip over to a browser and I'll just get a new tab, should be able to find them online. So I'll say Marmo set tool bag. You can go to their site. It's uh, marmoset.co uh, tool bag. And click on it. And you could buy a tool bag or try it. So if you guys are unsure which uh, version you want to use, uh, you 
you know, either Mac or Windows, you know, if you're trying it on home, they are supported for Mac and uh, Windows. <clears throat> you can buy it, Andrew, or try it. Uh, if you're a new user, it's about $149, uh, and that's a full non-expiring license, which is great. Um, if you already own it and you need to upgrade it, it's actually a few dollars cheaper. It's uh, 105 for one seat. So uh, I'm not sure what your, your budgie is, but uh, you know, do look into it. Probably two things that I would really suggest coming out of this class, or three things, would be ownership of Marmoset tool bag. Uh, X normal is free uh, if you look into that the Quixel suite which is around the same price it's not actually not that bad so if I make a new tool and I go Quixel .se, and this is the tool that I'm using uh, that is very similar uh, in some regards to uh, substance painter uh, which is you know both are sharing a, a, a level of notoriety right now as far as PBR uh, texture uh, applications but if you're most if you want to cut some of the learning curve out and you're most used to Photoshop I would highly suggest using Quixel uh, it, it does wonders um, and there's a lot more flexibility now with suite 2 which just recently got released um, as far as like painters uh, that you can use to paint literally on your model uh, masking advanced uh, Dyna masking uh, brushes, you know, texture brushes that you can use to uh, add in wear and tear onto your models uh, and or, you know, just offer some more realistic type of uh, effects like what's going on in my browser. And it also has a, an improved uh, 3D viewer uh, which can calibrate for, you know, Unreal or, um, you know, it has some lighting scenarios that it shares probably with Marmoset uh, which are really cool. And you can calibrate for different render engines, like say Octane, Arnold, uh, you know, Unreal 4, uh, you know, Toolbag, Toolbag with Metalness, uh, and so forth and so on. So uh, do look into it. Uh, as far as the shop, let's take a look. So uh, Quixel Suite 2.0 for an indie uh, hobby and freelance license is 139 bucks. But there are three different applications that you get with it, which is really awesome. And you should probably look forward to, I know that they've they've announced, but quite haven't come out with it yet. But um, they are soon going to have a service that you guys should look into called Megascans, which is uh, going to be really wicked uh, for the future. Um, I, I don't know much more about it than that, but it, it's going to be a service where you'll be able to, uh, you know, get or download or purchase uh, some textures from what I know. And uh, they're all tileable and real-world scanned, uh, physically-based uh, render materials. So that is really cool. Uh, and again, I'll go over to Topo Gun. And uh, give it a run there. Topo Gun, unfortunately, hasn't been updated in a, a little bit, as far as I know. But... Uh, it, it is a really cool tool, uh, especially in, in and around the areas of, you know, not only doing topology, but it more so it's, uh, it will bake um, out your maps. So I use Hedis uh, to bake out, or actually I use Hedis, excuse me, to do my UV layouts, uh, but a lot of the baking and a lot of the topology that I've been doing from ZBrush actually comes from Topogun 2. Uh, it's a very light, robust uh, piece of software that allows you to open up your OBJs and or your decimated uh, multi-million pixel meshes and then do topology right over that, optimize it, and then do a bake after that, you know, once you have those uh, UV'd. So <clears throat> let me do open up a new tab and I'll hit Hedis. UV layout. Hedis is an Australian company, as far as I know, uh, but they have a very wicked uh, pro tool uh, for doing UVs. And akin to probably UV layout, anything uh, like uh, you know UV layout or roadkill, uh, some of you might have heard of, would be awesome tools. I know that some of the UVing tools in Maya have recently been um, uh, a little bit more improved uh, now that 16 is out, but uh, I haven't used them a whole lot and I, I actually in Maya I prefer not to do a, lot, a whole lot of UVing I actually go outside of Maya to do it and my place of choice would be Hedis 
Uh, mostly that's because of the fact that Hedis, uh, you know, it, it's just a, a really nice leap, you know, done, very simple, easy to get tool for doing unwraps, and it has an awesome algorithm for flattening. Uh, that is probably the most important thing. But uh, currently it's in version 209. I think it's uh, 209 with uh, Pro would be the version that uh, is the most current. Uh, I might have a, a slightly older version, but I can't remember because I haven't updated it. But um, to buy it, uh, for a professional version is 300, hobbyist 200, and if you're a student, which most of you should probably qualify for, it is 100 bucks. Uh, I don't think that there are much features that are really changed between them. Uh, they are supported for Mac and Windows, and uh, the only you know, thing that I can see here that probably you should look for is this, and that license expires after 12 months. So, uh, you know, if you continue, you know, taking classes or if you're registered in school, you can just know that you can pick it up for a little bit cheaper at 100 bucks. So uh, those softwares are pretty much the lineup of things that I use post ZBrush uh, in addition to Maya. Uh, Maya being one of those things where I, I use it as a poly editor and not for much else. I'm not really doing any rigging or anything of the sort. But, uh, you know, my, my use for it is a little bit more simple than maybe another person's. So, but I, I just use it as a poly editor for the most part. So back to tool bag. Uh, most of those elements are what they are. Uh, you know, leaving off in the camera, you can adjust a lot of your focus and distortion. Um, and you can add post effects um, to your art. So in other words, you can mess with the color, exposure, sharpening, uh, any of the type of bloom effects. Like bloom would be like the extra cast light from, uh, it's kind of a, a bloom effect on any of the lights that you have in the atmosphere. You can set those so that they give it a little bit of glow. And you can set the size for that naturally. So if I size up and turn up the brightness, It'll have sort of a, a glowy, airy kind of uh, look to it. Especially some of these things in the environment you can see are kind of giving off a little bit of a glow. Uh, I'm not going to set that too high. Right about there should be fine. Uh, vignette, which would be, you know, sort of a darkening of the edges. Actually, let me open that back up turn the strength up. So if I needed a vignette around my image, here is the slider for that. And you could go down the list, you know, you could add grain, which would give it a little bit of noise uh, and graininess. But uh, usually a very small touch of these. Uh, also in under distortion, I have a little bit of chromatic aberration, uh, which basically shifts. It's kind of like an old camera trick. You know, like you would see in something like this in Polaroids where it uses uh, different color separations to make up the image and you get a little bit of that color bleed around the edges. Uh, it's a very nice effect, um, but I use it sparingly on some of my images uh, just so that it, it doesn't look overly burned or uh, crazy with distortion. Just a small amount usually does the trick. Okay, so those are most of the camera features, and under that you would see different settings for your actual meshes, uh, mostly just for transform and file reference. Uh, so in other words, if you needed to reload it or bring it in uh, again, you could, here's where you could set the path for that. Uh, so all of this stuff, um, generally, I don't have to reload uh, or improve upon, unless, of course, um, I somehow maybe change the UV set and the geometry, I and I save it under the same name, I could literally bring it back in or, you know, have it uh, update the mesh automatically. So most of these materials, like if I, if I update some of the maps, so I, I think I told you guys these are the different materials, and in one material uh, I have my normal gloss albedo map, which is the same as diffuse metalness plugged into. Uh, and then I just click and drag those materials to the actual mesh piece that I'm applying them to. So basically how I start with that is that I get the default and then just simply make a duplicate. And once I have a duplicate, so, uh, the, the duplicate selected, I just change the name to the part or give it a, an actual title. 
and then I can you know export uh, this material or save it. Uh, generally they save along with the file but you could export the material individually uh, if you needed to bring it into another scene file. Uh, but once I set all of these up um, there are some presets in here that use uh, you know PBR textures like uh, you know Quixel has a bunch in here that they've made uh, for Toolbag 2 but there's also aluminum, chromium, you know, a couple of different, uh, you know, templates and whatnot that you could actually just, uh, you know, drag and drop on. In fact, there's even an Unreal 4 template, which is interesting. I didn't really notice that one. But if you wanted to get uh, any of your material uses kind of calibrated to the same as using Unreal 4, I suppose you could, you know, uh, select this and then like so. And then once you had the Unreal, you could drag it on and then you know you could select your normal map or what have you so let's say for example uh, texture render materials and I think that's my helmet and let me just view this as list to make sure I'm grabbing the right stuff Yep, that looks good. So I think I have uh, in here a bunch of targas. That's where I go by type. And the targas are more, most optimal for using as maps, uh, either targas or PNGs. Uh, PSDs are a little bit heavier, but they're probably uh, ever so slightly slower in loading, and I just use them for testing generally. But final maps uh, for doing renders, I usually save out as targas with either 24 or I believe, believe it's 32-bit compression, more than likely 32-bit compression. Okay, and let's just move this over so I can see the which is which. And I could select that normal and plug it in, and there we go. So this would be my normal for this. That looks to be the same right normal. And it looks a bit metallic, doesn't it? So, uh, gloss map, same place, same directory, gonna add the gloss. And individually I would start probably adjusting these and see how much gloss that I wanna add in. Uh, adjust the horizontal smoothing a little bit. There we go. And if you notice in my gloss, I actually have some of the decal stuff left in which is neat because that means that sometimes when I turn these uh, and I get all of the maps in there, some of them actually have a bit of a metallicity uh, level to them. Uh, so I'll add in the albedo. And that's in. Right? So the richness in the color, I would say, looks just ever so slightly different so this, this color would probably be more how it would be in Unreal, right? Using a metalness workflow. So I'm gonna finally add in my metalness map. Uh, up, 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 metalness, there we go. And so I would say that probably a little bit of my gloss, which I turned down earlier, if I turn it up, and now have my metalness in there. See, as, as I adjust my metalness, it's already pretty much set, so I can just leave it at one. So this is literally how my maps would look inside of uh, Unreal. And it would probably actually look a little bit slightly different if I had calibrated uh, these maps to be done with the Unreal engine. Uh, inside of Quixel when I did it. In fact, I, I think that it's probably got some general sort of set specularity terms as far as like this, the, the gloss map goes and between the gloss and the, the metallosity, it's giving you kind of what it thinks that the specularity on some of these objects would be. Cool thing is, is that when you look at some of these lights, uh, I can tell that in and around some of the areas where there are rubber uh, that, uh, you know, Probably that's going to be a little bit more spot on to what it should be. So, interesting change. So, uh, that's Unreal for that. And then if I go back to my normal one, you can notice that there's a little bit more specularity and a little bit more metallosity in terms of uh, some of the different details of the surface. All right. 
But Quixel is what gives me, you know, all of this nice wear and tear here, uh, especially in and around, you know, where it, the, the normal and the bump uh, came into use. And I was able to, you know, lift some of the, you know, sort of wear and tear details uh, up a little bit and give it some bump. Uh, that stuff's really cool. And it, it happens, you know, kind of on the fly uh, as you do it in Quixel. And you can see the results immediately. Uh, the only difference, uh, I think, probably in the way that I exported is um, don't be confused with actually working with the maps that you make into PSDs because it, it automatically makes all of its uh, working files in PSDs when you use Quixel. I'll probably go over that a little bit later uh, in the, or in another section of this video. But also there's, you know, uh, propagating decals uh, across uh, a few different maps using the, the layer propagator. Uh, all of these maps were done you know, or excuse me, the decals for these maps were done um, in Illustrator and then just poured it over. And so I have a, a decal sheet for that. Uh, probably when, by the time that I put this up for you guys, when class finishes, there are certain elements that I'm going to give you guys and, and pass on to you so that you can actually open them and, and look with uh, at them yourself and or try them on a model of your own. So that would be cool. All right, and uh, I think probably one of the last things in this beyond some of the camera settings, the mesh settings, lastly, I have fog built in. So fog is uh, a cool trick that you can use in your render environment uh, to kind of give some atmosphere to your model. So I have it turned off presently, but if I turn it on, you notice that it starts to sort of dim out the background. And there's also the max opacity which is set for how much of the background that you actually see so something like this I actually like to use with the sky so if I take the sky and change the mode from sky which is a clear photograph HDRI image and actually give it a blur so a blurred sky uh, I just get sort of like the atmosphere I don't get the details of the background and that's not what's important what's important is the lighting and the actual model itself for presentation value so I can hide some of those details and then add fog, which gives you a sense of depth and atmosphere. And if I change the distance a little bit, so that's less of a distance, probably going down the scale gives you a little bit more. I don't want to flush out the model, but just softly blend it in between the two. And that's a nice balance right there. And max opacity would uh, gray out a little bit more of the density of the fog for the background so I think uh, right about there should be nice so right there I think I can probably in combination with some of the other camera settings that I have uh, I have a nice little scenario of light for myself I can turn this maybe a darker edge here and some atmospheric lights that are up top that are sitting on on top of the helmet that looks pretty nice I could do something like that and then pull it back for a shot or save a scene in either main camera and camera one. So if I make one say the front and one say the back, that looks nice. I also have uh, in some of these, I believe in under render. So there's render, render settings here as well. Uh, the resolution, uh, so you could do half, I'm doing one to one, or you could do doubled. If I flip that over, here you can make anti-aliasing settings so either none or four times temporal uh, I think one to one should be fine for now because I'm still working this out but later on when I do a, a hardcore render I guess I suppose I could use the the viewport resolutions uh, stereo uh, stereo 3d I'm not actually I don't mess with this a whole lot but I suppose if you're doing some kind of like 3d image where you have goggles you know or glasses you could actually save out a render that's split for stereographic. Uh, scene, uh, if you wanted to showcase uh, your model textured or untextured but with a wireframe, all you would need to do is check here and you could turn up the wireframe amount and it'll show you. Uh, my model right now presently, because I've done some messing around with height, I believe it actually automatically changes things into sort of a, an optimal triangulated mesh. It's actually all quads. Literally, the mesh is literally all quads. But for preview value, I believe Topo Gun, uh, although it did quads, 
you know, and brought it, you know, you brought it into Marmoset, it will actually display some of your wire uh, sometimes uh, with tries. And this happens, sometimes I think it flips it over if I put in a height map or a displacement map or mess with some of the tessellation uh, and some of those tessellation, because I use tessellation, it actually puts some of that stuff in. So here, if you notice, like there's a subdivision tab at the very top. If I change to like either PN triangles or flat, it uses tessellation to actually give my model a lot of depth. Uh, by default, it's about maybe 126 to 128. I think it's 128. And I wouldn't crank that up too high, but what it does is it uses uh, tessellation in the model's uh, geometry to actually offer more details. And if you have a displacement or a height map, it can actually push some of those uh, I don't know, details in those maps out so that it, there's actually more geometry than there actually is. So it's kind of a, a trick of, a, of an illusion, but you know, displacements, when you combine them with other maps, they have a full effect. Like a displacement plus normal plus uh, color map, uh, you know, you could build certain geometry that literally it's the shape is flat on the actual mesh, but in you know displacement mode it, it would actually poke out some of these rivets and stuff like that. But I'm not going to be using uh, subdivision on this. I don't think I need it because I think I have enough in my normal map and the working bump map, which has been combined with the normal. So. There's that, but you could also change the color of your wire to anything you want it. So, like, let's say if I want it white or kind of off-white in between, make it very subtle, sort of a gray color. I could do a shot like this where I could showcase my wire work if I wanted to or not. So I'm going to turn this off. Uh, lighting, local reflections, ambient occlusion. Ambient occlusion uh, is in here, but... Uh, ambient occlusion on this level, it, it's kind of almost redundant to have it here. I have, to, I have it turned on for, you know, just, you know, frou frou -ness, if you if you will. Uh, but it only adds like a little bit of shadow. Uh, my occlusion size is, and strength are not that high for this ambient occlusion setting. And that happens because, uh, you know, when in Quixel, I actually add the ambient occlusion in, and a lot of the ambient occlusion information is actually baked into the model uh, in its... Uh, uh, along with its uh, albedo map. So I don't need to go uh, too high on the ambient occlusion settings here because then you know sometimes uh, things will look too dark or too dirty uh, if you have uh, if you overdo the ambient occlusion. Uh, watermarking is basically this here so like if you cut out or export uh, a still uh, you can either either use the the watermark or not use it uh, and put your own logo or what have you there watermark there. Uh, dark changes it to an all dark setting and high res shadows uh, have to do with some of the shadow work that happens between objects. So I'm using uh, high res shadows so that when I rotate some of these lights, the resolution of the cast shadow becomes a little bit higher. Uh, and that's about it. Yep. So uh, I think I'm actually going to switch that back. I can either use one tone or two tone. I like two tone. Uh, animation has to do with the scene turntable, and um, when you do these, uh, as you set this number, like let's say I set something low like that, let's say I set it to 4.5, and I rotate the scene and I play it, it's literally going to show me here uh, how it's rotating. If I turn this up, I get a little bit more speed out of it. And at least here, I can kind of see how my real-time render is happening uh, with the, ro the model rotating. And as you know, notice that it's rotating, it's actually rotating uh, its perspective as far as the lights go, right? So this whole scene is, is being turned. If I did set this to zero, and I come around and do a camera turntable, let's say five for that. It would literally rotate everything. But it's the camera that's moving around the object. And I think I could bump this up if I wanted to. So that looks really good. Uh, and I could export a turntable, uh, which I think would cut it out 
as far as like uh, it would probably export it as an image sequence and then you would use that image sequence in something like either Photoshop or another compiler software like say maybe After Effects or someplace and you could literally c cut in scenes of footage like 24 frames per second or 30 frames per second and uh, edit your your showcase a little bit better uh, because and let's see if I stop it and I come over to I believe it's uh, capture uh, here under the capture menu are all of those um, exports for you know either image uh, an image and open which would whatever that setting would be uh, it will open in in the image editor of your choice so probably Photoshop uh, image to clipboard so copying it uh, cutting out a turntable and here are the settings for it so I think it, my settings on my screen I would do a 1080 so 1920 by 1080 for high def and but you could match viewport and or set it to a, a different size like 1024 or something like that uh, sampling has to do with the type of sampling or how many samples it runs uh, for the resolution so I think I have mine pretty much high, which is 16x, but you could set it up to 25. Uh, and the format, so in other words, if I'm doing uh, just a still image, I could export it as a JPEG, PNG, Targa, PSD, and 16-bit, which would be higher bit uh, PSD or Photoshop document. Uh, and you could do it with transparency. So if I have transparency checked, it's going to actually give me a layer mask or an alpha mask. Uh, layer uh, on top of the render uh, so that you know I could put my own background or you know I don't have to do any clipping it's already automatically clipped out uh, using an alpha mask so rotation is set to scene and clockwise and it has uh, 30 frames per second as a frame rate and uh, you can give it a duration so if I want it to turn for like say f you know two to five seconds I would just give it a you know 5.0 and then say OK, and you know it would render out uh, probably an image sequence uh, uh, of the rotation. Okay, with all of the camera settings that I've made intact. So it looks pretty cool when it when it's rotated. And of course, you can hide all of the interface elements, or the UI elements, by just hitting the spacebar. And there's your model. Okay, so I'm going to stop this. And I'm going to take one short break. And then when I come back, I'm actually going to start in on doing some UVs. Because I, I want to take a run through Hennis and take the same mesh that I have for this helmet and show you how I cut it up.